One out of 45 children experience some form of homelessness each year, according to the National Center on Family Homelessness. Tonight, we'll talk about how we can reach out to them. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guest, I want to mention that today is the feast of St. Barnabas, and he's counted among the apostles. If you recall, when, Christian, when Jewish Christians began evangelizing Gentile Christians in Antioch, Barnabas went up there to check it out and see what was going on. And when he saw how well it was succeeding, he called St. Paul to come help because St. Paul had grown up in Tarsus, which is a Gentile city, Greek city. And then later on, he and St. Paul uh, had their hands laid on them to go out and evangelize all over Asia Minor. And even when he split from St. Paul, uh, he went down to preach in Cyprus. Uh, we had a great ministry. And there's even a letter attributed to him uh, called the Letter of Barnabas. Uh, and you can get that, I'm pretty sure, from our website and from all over uh, the, the Internet that's easily accessible and a very important early document in the church, even if it's not part of the Bible. Well, let's now get over to our guest. You know, I mentioned that we have this problem with homeless young people, and our guest works hard to provide homeless kids with physical and spiritual shelter, along with the life skills they'll need to break the cycle of homelessness, abuse, and despair. He is the president and the CEO of Covenant House International, which has served over a million homeless youth throughout North in South America since the 1960s. So please welcome our guest, Mr. Kevin Ryan. Kevin, Thanks, Father. Thanks for having me. good to have you here. Thank you. Good to have you here. Welcome. How long have you been working with Covenant House? Well, I had hair when I started, so that's uh, <laughs> uh, 22 years. 22 years. Yeah, 22 uh -huh. years. And, uh, you know, and you, you began doing what? How did I you start Right, off? I started, I was doing legal aid work, so. Because you have a degree in law. Right, right, I, I used to be a lawyer. I, w I wouldn't trust myself with any sort of legal work now, but once upon a time I was working with homeless kids in New York City mm -hmm. um, at Covenant House, and they, ha you know, they had a myriad set of issues. Uh, some of those issues had to do with the fact that they, you know, had their identity stolen, and so they had huge debt. Some of these kids hadn't been in school in a very long time, and they were trying to get back into school. School. Some of the kids uh, were involved in very messy family situations, domestic violence. Um, it was the grassroots poverty law practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. The, there would be a number of things of which, uh, due to them being victims as well as their own right. sometimes criminal behavior. You know, the first time I bounded into Covenant House, I had this hope that I could be part of making the world a better place. And I remember it was September seventh, nineteen ninety-two. The first kid I met, Binny. Uh, at 41st and 10th in Manhattan, was uh, rocking back and forth in the office. She, I couldn't even tell you what color her eyes were for the first half hour because she was just cradling herself. Her cheeks were soaked. And she told me the story of never knowing her father. Her mother um, died when she was a teenager, very, I think, 13. She was turned over to her aunt who disenrolled her from school and made her a domestic. She was responsible for doing all of the cooking and the cleaning uh, in that family. She was, by the time she was 15, turned over to a local gang, and she was trafficked, pros prostituted, serially raped through her adolescence. She escaped uh, when she was 17 years old, and she made it to the Port Authority bus terminal. 
And I know it's impossible now in this post 9-11 world to believe that a homeless kid could live in an airport terminal or a bus terminal for any length of time and not be noticed. But before 9-11, that was very common in New York. Mm -hmm. Finally, a Port Authority cop found her, saw her eating out of a trash bin and brought her to Covenant House. And her life was upside down. You know, she had to say the least. It was, and we we found our way together. It was sort of the worst of a John Grisham novel because I was I had all the arrogance and none of the skill that law school should provide, <laughs> and I often was very nervous when I was interacting with her. We'd be in court, and she'd be holding my hand, whispering to me, "It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay." Um, we found our she way together. She was comforting you often, often comforting me. And it was the beginning, though, most seriously, of a solar eclipse at Covenant House. I just saw a place filled with broken hearts, violence, exploitation, kids who had had unbelievable things happen to them, and a house, a house filled with these kids, hundreds of kids. And I had determined I was going to leave Covenant House. I thought in my head that this was the story I would tell in my life, that it was an interesting thing to have done, a nice place to have worked. And I ran into her after three unsuccessful job interviews. This is about three years into my Covenant House time. And she was a waitress at uh, Rachel's Restaurant at, at uh, 43rd and 8th. Just happened to bounce into her. She's taller than me, which I don't think I had appreciated before, which will tell you something about how self-absorbed I was and probably still am. Didn't appreciate her stature. She was radiating. And she gave me a big hug. How are you? Good. How are you? She was wearing a, a white apron, a, blade, a bright blue waitress uniform. She told me that she was putting herself through nursing school. Uh, oh. and, I, and I said, um, what do you want to do? And she said, well, the happy news is I've met a boy who loves me in the right way. I just, I, even now for my own kids, I love that phrase. I've met a boy who loves me in the right way. Yeah. And she said she was putting herself through nursing school because she wanted to work in a NICU PICU unit, which is the part of the hospital where neonatal, perinatal, very sick infants are cared for. And I know the conversation didn't just end then because we must have kept talking, but, but as I look back on it now, I don't remember anything beyond this central question, which has both haunted and inspired my life ever since. And it's that, how does a kid go from never knowing her dad and losing her mom and being betrayed by her aunt and then serially raped through her adolescence? She's fending for herself in a terminal. She shows up at a homeless shelter. She's completely beaten down. She feels completely empty. And within three years, she decides to give her life to helping other women's sick children get better. And I don't mean that in a sentimental or saccharine way. I just no, mean that no, in the no, truest way. Yeah. And I realized that it was God's providence. It's the miracle of God's love in the world. And I had been focused so much on the darkness and the hardship of Covenant House that I had forgotten that there was a bridge kids were crossing. Not every kid, but a lot of kids to first jobs and to healing and to first apartments and to graduations. Um, and then I was hooked. You know, I just... I was sitting in the mezzanine seats, and then I just decided to go straight into center orchestra, and I sit ringside now, you know, at some of the most miraculous transformations of the human spirit across, you know, six countries. And none of it's easy, and none of it happens right away, but I do see the miracle of God's providence every day revealed in the lives of these kids. You know, I'd like the audience just to, to get perspective on what's going on with uh, young people today. Um, and as a perspective, in 1940, 4% of all children were born outside of wedlock. In 1960, it had only gone up to 5%, and that that increase was primarily in the African-American community, which was about 16% of children born out of wedlock. But from then until now, the national figures are 43% of all children in the country are born to unwed mothers, 73% of African Americans, about 52% of Hispanics, 29% of Caucasians. And in this situation, kids they didn't choose this, but they're born into these high risk, usually, I mean, this is usually a guarantee of poverty. And, you know, th this is a real situation. Are these the kind of kids you're coming across? So many, the vast majority of our kids know 
no paternal love in strobe flashes. You know, they, very few of them have any real sense of fatherhood or of a dad being in their lives. Because the, their dads, you know, it's a whole sired mess. them, but they, they never know them. It, it's a whole, I mean, it could be that their fathers are drug addled, that they are, have disappeared, they've never been on the scene, that they're dead. Um, it's a whole mix, but many of these kids don't know dad. Um, and none of these kids have asked for this. I mean, these, these are young people who unfortunately get raised in situations that just test them over and over and over again and, and f frankly fill them with a sense of being worthless and not mattering in the world. <laughs> yes. You know, I say all the time that I think I can sing in church on Sunday because my mother told me a whole set of lies that I had a beautiful voice when we were little in church. She's like, you have a beautiful voice, sing out. So now I do sing out in church and my children cringe. This is the one thing they really <laughs> resent their grandmother for. But when that story fills you of purpose and accomplishment and achievement, it becomes your story. And for our kids, you know, all the different resonances and timbers and pitches of these voices from people over and over and over again who've said to them, you don't matter, you don't fit in, you don't belong, that just becomes their own voice. And people ask me, well, how could a 14-year-old or how could a 16-year-old decide um, to join a gang or decide to become a drug mule right. or decide, um, you know, to, um, you know, fall into the clutches of a trafficker who prostitutes them in Toronto or Atlantic City or the Hollywood Strip where it goes on, you know, visibly every day or, or New York City, you know, it's because we have a whole generation of homeless young people who feel broken inside. And our job at Covenant House is to reveal to them, and this, this sounds easy and it's completely daunting, is to reveal to them that they are made in the image and likeness of a God who deeply loves them and that there's a purpose for their lives. You know, we can feed kids a lot, right? That doesn't take care of the problem. We can put a roof over 2,000 kids' heads a night. That doesn't fix the problem. What fixes the problem is when the people of God come together to be love in the world for kids yes. whose families have not been that. Yep. And then, you know what? Then it's an escalator. Then kids are soaring. We're helium for kids' dreams when we reveal to them the divinity that is within them and the noble purpose that is you know, their future. And then they embrace the great promise of tomorrow. And it's not about gangbanging, and it's not about joining the Crips or the Bloods, and it's not about a one night stand, and it's not about shelter. It's about, you know, the revelation of life. This is, this is why I think the work is incredibly hard and incredibly uh, simple at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, on one hand, uh, this very large group of children is a victim of a culture that sees the attitudes of adults in their relationships as paramount and that children don't matter right. what how the adults feel that's what it's about me right and these kids are the victims of that on so many levels i i know that um we were talking earlier there's a lot of trafficking. Now, when you say trafficking, mm -hmm. uh, is this boys and girls? Boys and girls. And trafficking is just the language that we use today um, to describe, you know, the commercial sexual exploitation of children. So, so they're, when, they're basically selling these kids right. for sexual use. Exactly. Yes. And there are, you know, we recently worked with Fordham University to understand the prevalence of commercial sexual exploitation trafficking just in one house at our Covenant House in New York. I should say we work in six countries. We, we touch 56,000 kids a year, but in this one house in New York, um, you know, we, we wanted to understand how many of you, how many of you kids have experienced this? A quarter of the kids. And if you extrapolate that out over the course of a year in this one house on one block in Midtown Manhattan, that is almost 3,000 young people who have experienced this level of sexual commodification, violence, and it's, it's not just about, you know, we, we're focused in this culture a lot um, on the wrong things. This is about kids' spirits being devoured by darkness. Kids feel worthless. They don't understand that, that their body's a temple, that their future is bright and promising, that God loves them. They don't believe that, and there's a lot of evidence to support their cynicism about this. Sure. The, I remember as a kid, we would ride New Jersey transit trains into the city, right, to see the Rockefeller Center Christmas, Christmas tree get lit up or to go to a Yankees game. But the first time I went on street outreach with Covenant House in 1992, October, 
I met a pregnant 13 year old in those Amtrak tunnels in New York who had been getting bought and sold um, in Midtown Manhattan. And when she got pregnant, was visibly pregnant. She was no longer valuable to her pimp and she was discarded. And she and a group of teenagers were fending for themselves in the Amtrak tunnels. And a culture that permits that, allows that, sustains that, and isn't absolutely apoplectic about that, gives kids lots of reasons to believe that they don't matter. Right. See, that's, you know, there's a sense um, of making known this because a lot of people have little sense of how much, in effect, sexual slavery is being perpetrated all over the world. All over but the world. But that includes the United States. That's exactly right. I mean, a lot of people think that this is limited, um, at least in the Americas, to Central and South America. And we work um, in Central and South America, so, so certainly there are countries um, where our kids in those countries are being sexually abused routinely. But this is happening all across the United States as well, and it's, it's why when the Pope decided very early in his service um, to meet with very visibly um, survivors of human trafficking and then to draw the world's attention to the global imperative to really bring on the fight against global trafficking because this is a vast criminal conspiracy run by um, lucrative cartels across the world. It really is going to require um, robust prayer and real political will and muscle for us to defeat what I see every day becoming this increasingly discouraging um, and, and increasingly prevalent scourge of human trafficking among children in the United States. And, and globally. And globally. I, I, one of the things that is shocking, and, and our State Department is aware of this, that there are more slaves today than there were in 1800. That's true. But they're not out in the cotton fields. Right. They're in the brothels. They're in the brothels. There, there's a great uh, worship song that an Irish worship band wrote called um, God of the City. And they wrote it uh, because they were in a brothel in Thailand. And they noticed above them on the second level of the bar, it wasn't a brothel, it was a bar, they thought it was a bar, these girls, these teenage girls, the faces of 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds, and they saw these men going up into the rooms with the girls coming down and they realized that they were in a place where kids were, were every day and hourly being bought and sold. And it was so discouraging to them and so profoundly worrisome that it inspired this beautiful song, um, you know, which we sing uh, at our candlelight vigil in November across all of our covenant houses, um, reminding ourselves we are never in this alone. We are never in this alone. This is God's covenant house. We work there. And this movement to fight human trafficking, it's got to be God's fight and we've got to be, we've got to be agents in that fight. See, one of the things that uh, I, I think is very important to remember is that it was the church that fought against slavery. Uh, I believe it was St. Gregory of Nyssa who wrote back in the fourth century that God made these people in His image and likeness and He gave them a free will. Who do you think you are to take that which God had given. You're acting in this as if you are greater than God. And that characterized the church's policy, including the condemnation of the African slave trade from the first few months it started in the fifth, uh, 1430s by Pope Eugene and condemnations. And this is where the church has to come back again. It, and what you're doing is, seems to be part of that. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the bishops have spoken about this and certainly the movement that's growing in the United States. First, to talk honestly about this problem. You know, we were saying earlier, and I so deeply believe this is true, that one of the challenges we have is we still haven't made visible the contours of this problem. So lots of people hear us talk about homeless children who are sexually victimized and 
there's no there's no corollary in their community or in their experience. Right. Right. So they so they think this is something exotic and Martian and it doesn't feel real to them. And I think we We're have third to, world. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and it's the, our challenge, I think, is to talk honestly and openly about the incidents of commercial sexual exploitation of young people, but really also to marshal the political will and the social will to create a social taboo around the buying and selling of children. If we were half as focused about this and passionate about this as we are, for example, around secondhand smoke, imagine the progress we could make mm -hmm. in protecting children from this in the same way that we have you know, change the world on smoking, we still have so many kids, so many kids who every day wake up and their reality is, you know, some queue of loveless Johns um, who aren't interested in relationship. They're interested in, you know, something that's instinctual and incredibly self-absorbed, using that kid, throwing that kid away, exchanging cash, and then exiting. It's, it's the most pathetic piece of our human existence. And one of the realities, too, is that um, uh, I'm sure, because I, I just know the statistics from the Center for Disease Control, All right. that uh, there is a wide uh, spread, uh, uh, increase of different kinds of sexually transmitted diseases, sure. over 40 of them. 20% sure. of our culture at large is infected. And do you, do you come across, I, I, I just... Sure. I'm sure that these children get infected as well. Sure they do. Absolutely they do. I mean, I was, I was saying well, to you. Oftentimes with life-threatening diseases. We, we would bury teenagers at Covenant House in the early 1990s um, at least monthly and often more frequently than that because of the scourge of, of sexually transmissible diseases. And while advances in medicine make that not the case today, that doesn't mean that the infection rate has decreased. Lots of kids are burdened with chronic sexually transmissible diseases that they that they bear for the rest of their lives right. as a result of right. human trafficking. The toll that, you know, when people say, and you'll hear this, um, I hear this from folks all the time criticizing the position that Covenant House takes with respect to human trafficking. They talk about, you know, the right of sex workers to essentially go about their business. It's a victimless, um, you know, experience. And of course, that's completely untrue. You know, yeah. that's completely untrue. Uh, and it's so disconnected from the reality of the victimization of young people who feel like they have no choice and, and often don't have any choice, often are stuck in these places, barricaded, can't get out. Well, and even our government, I, one of the most infuriating things that this present administration did is take away the funding for the church's work in stopping human trafficking because we would not encourage abortion. Mm. And see, this is why voting for politicians who are pro-abortion has all sorts of other ramifications. That because we're against abortion, they, we were, had one of the most successful programs of helping people out of sexual trafficking in this country, run by the bishops and by the um, uh, Catholic charities, and they stopped because we won't tell them to go get abortions. Well, this is crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's not that nice. It's evil. And this is where we you know why helping a place like Covenant House is so important. Well, in, in general, I think it's the downside to deep collaboration um, you know, outside of the private sector. So working with government is always going to involve a set of restrictions that there will be opportunities there too because investment always creates opportunities but it also is going to create restrictions on how a movement progresses and what its voice says and how resonant it is and how far you amplify what you believe in so you know the upside to covenant house and the challenge for covenant house is that we're mostly privately funded so you don't yeah. bother with the government so they can't tell you what to do that, you know, I, I sort of emphasize that, but the challenge is raising $160 million a year. We're, that's, so we're, yeah. that's really hard to do. And right. it is, though, the miracle of God's providence in this work because there's no way this should work, right? I mean, how could this institution sustain itself 
but millions of people, um, sometimes sending $5 a month or $10 a month, really believe in trying to get kids off the street and give them a safe place to be. And that's why I never talk about Covenant House as a set of shelters, and I always talk about us as the people of God being love in the world, because it's coaches and teachers and empty nesters and volunteers and our staff who are coming together to be love in the world for these kids. It is the shelters for sure that help us bring kids off the street, but it's bigger than that. You know, it's so much bigger than that. If all we did was shelter kids, a lot of those kids would go back to the streets. Yeah. We got, you gotta use that moment when they come in the front door to get those kids to love themselves. A lot of these kids hate the world because they hate themselves. They and feel they broken. And they believe that everybody else hates them. Nobody God, loves them. They think God hates them. Yeah. They think God hates them. A lot of the kids think God hates them. And so revealing to kids, not only does our God not hate you, but our God made you in his image and likeness, loves you and wants so much more for you, you know, that is for some kids a really complex sell. But when they get it, Turn, you know. That, that turns yeah. them around. Right, we have a member of our board now. Uh, so my boss, who's a former Covenant House kid, and uh, you know, now she works at Morgan Stanley. She's a grandmother. <laughs> um, and she tells all the time the story of walking in there at 41st and 10th, you know, feeling so brokenhearted and not believing she had a future. And now, of course, she's a matriarch. She has a wonderful future. She's got a successful career in financial services. And the most beautiful thing, forget the money she makes, right? The most beautiful thing, she broke the cycle. She loved her kids well. She loved her grandchildren well. Those kids loved their kids. She's, she's renewed, not just you know, her family, but this American promise. See, this is one of the key elements of people of faith being involved in such things. This isn't social work that you're doing. This is Christian love. This is Christian love. This is Christian love. In letting people know who God is, that Christ gave himself for them. And you know that we, we can, the, the government can't do that. They're, they're, and they can't get at that core issue. Government is never going to love children the way families must. Exactly. Never, never. We can wish it to be so. We can deeply want it to be so when human failure forces us to panic at the alternative, but government can't do it. No. We have to do it. Exactly. We have to do it. And when we do it, when we recognize these kids as our kids, right, as all God's children, and we make them our own, and I see this every day at Covenant House. My favorite, my favorite thing is the ladies who bake birthday cakes and then bring them to our Covenant Houses and sing happy birthday. So the tragedy of this is you can't believe how many teenagers have never had happy right. birthday sung to them. Right. But the joy of this is when kids see the sign that says on the wall, happy birthday, Keisha, happy birthday, Marcus, happy birthday, Tommy, they say, can I... Can I have that? Can I take that down? And then they put it up in their room. And then this mystery begins to unfold. They say to themselves, why does this lady I don't even know care so much about me that she baked a cake and brought it to the shelter and made me a sign and sang me a song? And it begins to reveal to them, maybe I'm not broken. Maybe that's a new voice that matters for me. And the math tutor and the job counselor and then all these really smart entrepreneurs and CEOs who give our kids the first job. Our kids are the hungriest, most aspiring young workers on the planet, right? Because yeah. they got a lot to prove. So people who say, yep, come and work in my establishment. I'm gonna give you an internship or an apprenticeship. Kids begin to feel like they matter, like yeah. they matter. And I'm just, I'm a small part of that. There are thousands of us across the Americas doing a little bit to say to kids, you matter, you matter. I, one of the ways I would summarize this is, the way that the parents of these children, by their absence, neglect, mm -hmm. drug use, mm -hmm. violence, mm -hmm. the way that the uh, various pimps, the, the, the men, usually men, mm -hmm. sometimes you, women, absolutely. but you, usually men, usually who men. sell these boys to yes. other men, right. or sell these girls to other men, right. um, because they're, they're, that's usually the usually, scenario. Yes. And those people are the barbarians. Mm -hmm. And that this work of Covenant House is the work of believers, mm -hmm. like the monks who went into barbarian occupied Europe mm -hmm. centuries mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. You're confronting these barbarian adults and, and rescuing these children mm -hmm. from the barbarity they would impose mm -hmm by letting them know the love of Christ. I think that's, you know, sometimes 
sometimes Christ has a kid's face. And I think about those kids carrying, carrying the wood um, yep. in Calvary. Yep. And sometimes we're helping carry the wood, but not mostly. And sometimes we're in the crowd screaming, how could you do this? But not mostly. What we mostly are is the unheralded, sacred, beautiful Veronica on her knees. Who even knows who noticed what she was doing, right? She wasn't screaming. She wasn't carrying the wood. She was present in a moment of profound human suffering, just the darkness that Christ felt. And here she was right next to him in this profound, lonely moment. And she was here. That's mostly what we are. We are not letting go. Like in the Old Testament, Ruth and Naomi, there's a famine, all the men are gone. And there's this desperate moment where mother-in-law says to daughter-in-law, go, I'm going to die in the desert. And she refuses to. And she says, no, wherever you go, I will go. Your people, my people, your God, my God. Where you live, I will live. Where you die, I will die. And there be buried beside you. That is who we are as a Covenant House movement. And then ends up becoming one of the ancestors of Jesus. Amen. We're going to take a break. I uh, want to let you know that if you're interested in finding out more about Covenant House, you can go to their website, which is covenanthouse.org. They also have a, an 800 number, 1-800-388-3888. A lot of eights. Uh, so we'll we'll take a break. Come back in a couple of minutes. We're going to get your questions and your calls, as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, again, just give a little bit more information about Covenant House. The Covenant House headquarters are in New York City at 461 8th Avenue, New York, New York, 10001. Uh, and again, their website is covenanthouse.org and their phone number is 1-800-388-388. Eight, eight. Also, uh, we want to let you know that you are very welcome to come here, be part of our studio audience. If you have a chance to come down, we would love to have you get in contact with our pilgrimage department. You can contact them at our website, which is uh, ewtn.com. Or you can also uh, get a hold of them, uh, you know, by phone. Uh, the number is 205-271-2966. And you can ask them all, uh, about scheduling of programs, masses, and tours of the studios. They'll give you information about getting up to Hansville and sing the, the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament up there. Uh, also, uh, they'll let you know places you can stay, uh, good places to eat. Now, you haven't had the fried green tomatoes, so you're going to have to come back down from New York City and get some good food. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, of course, uh, and even, even our restaurants are religiously themed. We have Golden Rule Barbecue mm. and Hamburger Heaven. Mm. 
Yes, that's right. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my lips are sealed. So, uh, yeah, but they'll give you all that kind of information that you need to know. And we'd love to have you be part of all, just like these nice folks, most of whom came from Dayton, Ohio, I've been able to do. And also, just before we get to our questions, I want to mention that one of our guests is a priest who's celebrating his 37th anniversary of ordination, a uh, young fella. Uh, he was ordained a year after I was. Uh, <laughs> either that or we're both getting up there. All right, you ready for some questions? I'm ready. Let's start off with this gentleman here. Sir, where are you from? I'm from India. Where in India? From the South Kerala. Kerala state. And I'm so, Father Joe's, who worked 34 years in the missions in India. Okay. In Karnataka. Great. And your question? You mentioned about hundreds of thousands of children you were handling. I would like to know uh, more of your dynamics within it, or techniques you, you use it, or how you involve families or uh, faith people. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's a great question. Thank you. So, so it starts with this. In every city we work in, and there's a little over 30 in six countries. So 30 cities, are, uh, and right. the, the six countries are in North and South America. Yeah, they're in, um, so we're in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, in Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Honduras. Okay. Um, and in these countries, it all begins with a team going out into the places where homeless youth congregate. So that could be the Eastern Market in Managua. It could be the mall in Anchorage. It could be the Hollywood Strip. They call the boardwalk in Atlantic City the Underwood Motel. So we have teams of people who create relationships with young people, right? They build trust with kids, and they invite kids to leave the streets, leave the gangs, leave the traffickers, and come inside to safety. When young people take us up on that, and it usually takes a minute for young people to develop the trust. A lot of these kids are very wary of adults. Sure. When they build up the well, trust. With good reason. Very good reason, yeah. very good reason. Sure. I mean, the last thing in the world that a homeless kid does is hop in the first van that pulls up and says, hey, I've got a safe place for you to sleep, right? right. So it takes a long time for us to build the rapport I should say, just really quickly, and push me back to focus if this goes on too long, one of the most sacred things I have ever seen, the street outreach team in the barrio uh, in the Eastern Market of Managua, pouring zanate, a yellow gooey gel, into the, into the scalps of severely addicted kids who are homeless on the street, six, seven, eight, nine years old, kids just zombified, kids completely lost to humanity, huffing glue out of a jar. And these adults go into the community, they massage their scalps, and you can see, you man, I mean, I imagine this is what Christ was calling us to do on Holy Thursday, right? With I think, the foot yeah, we've lost our way a little bit, right, in, on Holy Thursday, because everyone's getting, you know, manicures and pedicures before they show up on church, <laughs> their feet smell beautiful, and that's not what, that's not what Jesus was inviting us to, to yeah. do or be or see. But this, this moment of, of pure, um, loving interaction um, invites young people to trust. So we get young people using a variety of techniques to come in. When they come in, kids need a variety of things. They've got to exhale, they've got to rest, they need a shower, they need a warm meal. So it can take a day, it can sometimes take three days for young people to feel safe. Um, and, and for some young people, it will take longer. We then engage young people in building a plan. So we have teams of trained social workers who are talking with kids about what's going on in their lives and helping them build a plan. But Covenant House, just so we're clear, is not a place where teenagers are invited to hang out and do nothing. So every one of our kids, certainly by the end of the first week, are going to school, in a job training program, in a job, and most of the kids who've been with us for a month are working two jobs and finishing either their high school diploma or beginning their college studies. Mm -hmm. It's a place where we have curfews and there are expectations because what we're inviting kids to see is one, that they have a noble purpose and that they're invited to give back and they can make a contribution and no one's gonna hand them anything in this world. No one is going to hand them anything. They have got to earn it. And they're capable of earning it. They're capable of it. They're, they're designed for contribution. They're made to give back to others. And when yes. kids see this, it ignites the soul. Kids yep. come alive. 
So this, this is what we do. Now, some kids who have very serious trauma, especially victims of human trafficking, require intensive psychosocial treatment. So we have teams of psychiatrists, psychologists. We sometimes, in some of our programs, will use equine therapy. So kids will work with horses. I know very little about this, right? I'm not an expert in how we treat young people who are the victims of sustained sexual exploitation and abuse, but we work with professionals who do help kids uh, you know, cross that arc from victimization to recovery. Yeah, we, we did a show uh, some, about a year or so ago about equine therapy uh, for ch not, not children of the, this kind of abuse, but children who had various physical and mental handicaps. Okay. And the horses are fantastic. Unbelievable. I went, I went out there and the horses choose which kids they want to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 and the horses are great. Amazing. They're, 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 they really are amazing. Um, all right, let's take a phone call. Hello, Teresa. Hi, Father Mitch. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, and, where are you uh, from? I'm, I'm calling from New Hampshire. Oh, great, great. And your question? Um, well, I was sitting here and I was listening to Kevin's comment about um, the one covenant house in New York City and surveying how many kids had actually been trafficked. And I... You know, started that, building that out in my head exponentially, and it just became overwhelming at the thought of how many kids are actually bought and sold. And then the next question was, who is consuming this? I mean, you may have answered this while I was on hold, but I'm thinking this is not some guy hiding under an underpass. Um, you know, somebody is out there. And how much of the population is involved in buying children? I mean, are they walking amongst us looking like regular people, holding regular jobs? Or are they, um, you know, is it 30%? It's going to be an awfully large number purchasing this, God forgive me, product. Right. right. Oh, well, Teresa, yeah, you're asking a very important question. And, and, and the answer is yes, emphatically yes. And we should Some of these people are suits, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the people in, um, you know, very good jobs right. and such. The Manhattan District Attorney, the new one, Cy Vance, brought that city's first comprehensive human trafficking prosecution a couple years ago. And the defendants are financial services wizards from Wall Street. These are people who, by and large, are going home to intact families in the suburbs, making six figures, who are coming into the city and buying and selling young people. And, the, and this, is, this is what I'm suggesting when I say we've got to do a better job of both talking very publicly about the problem and making it visible, and then we really have to create a social taboo that says this is completely unacceptable. And you know, our country has a great tradition of prosecuting the prostitutes, as we have called a lot of these kids wrongfully but we have a long way to go in the prosecution of Johns and pimps. And, and, a long and, way to and go. by Johns, you mean the customers. I mean the customers. Right. They're the, the guys. They're the, they're, again, usually the men right. who, again, are, are pro using either boy prostitutes or girl prostitutes. Yep. Not as many women are, are, are doing some, but not as many. In terms of the youth? The, uh, with the youth. So I know, I've heard stories of some women who are... Um, the, the pimps, if you will. But in terms of the customers. users, the customers, in 22 years in this work, I've never heard of a single instance of a woman being the user. Now, okay. it's, pos it's possible, right? Sure. I'm sure it's possible, but it's not normative in my experience at all. This is, by and large, a problem um, that exists among men in our society, and it's, um, it's a sickness that we have got to weed out. And one of the things, Teresa and others, uh, a number of reports show that, uh, or, or claim that uh, 55 to 56 percent of married men cheat on their wives. They have extramarital affairs. And that go, that's just a range. They don't say, but there would be one source. And then, of course, there are many men who are not married, but are also going to uh, prostitutes mm -hmm. And and, uh, are, and many of the children, because they think mm -hmm. uh, these kids don't have the sexually transmitted diseases mm -hmm. that older people do. So that's that's what part of their myth. I, I think the challenge is to think about the problem 
you know, in terms of a marketplace, as disgusting as that is, right? So there's supply and demand. And on the supply side, we need much more vigorous and routine prosecutions of the men who buy and sell children. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes a real risk, right? When, when people are thinking twice about the fact, I could get busted and my life could blow up here, yes. right? Uh, the, the incidence and the prevalence of this will be reduced, right? right. That's just deterrence 101. Exactly. Then on the other hand, we're never going to be done with this problem as long as we live in a world where there are vulnerable, homeless children who have nowhere else to go, living under boardwalks, in alleyways, in tenements, in micro brothels. So we need to work both ends of the problem. And I think at Covenant House, we're very focused on the demand end. We want to bring kids out of vulnerability. But that doesn't mean that our partners in government, our partners in the other charities that work on this question, who are doing the supply work focused on prosecution, um, aren't doing vitally critical work. Right. So you need to do right. both. See, that, that really is the proper role of government, to prosecute this right. crime of sexual abuse of children. Right. That's, that is their job. That's right. And, you know, but the church's job is to, to care for them in a way that it's just not part of what government can or should do. Can't do it. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Springfield, Ohio. Good to have you here. What's your question? I know a little bit about the Indians out west. Uh, they have a big problem with, with kids uh, from families being abandoned because of drugs, drinking, and so forth. And In Chamberlain, South Dakota, the St. Joe's Indian School, they've set up some houses where they have a mother and a father come in and volunteer, and, they, and they'll set up seven, eight kids and try to get them straightened out. And I know one kid that went through the program that actually wound up at Coast Guard Academy. And I was wondering if the, how effective that program, if you know anything about it and how effective. Well, in general, the, the, um, the problem with our child welfare system across the United States is that government is trying to do what families have to do. And the answer is to make families a robust part of the solution. So kids who languish in foster care for a very long time, and we see a disproportionate number of kids aging out from foster care, so they hit 18, they get booted out, showing up at Covenant House. So the key there is what, what they call permanency, getting kids forever families who will love these kids. That is a huge part yes. of the solution. Yes. And then for kids who show up at Covenant House, getting adults involved in their lives who will be family for them, who will be love for them. I never feel good about a young person leaving and telling me I got my first apartment, and then I say to them, okay, well, who's your community? Who's your tribe? Who's your family? Right. And they can't identify anybody, because that young person is coming back our way. Because it's not enough to have a lease. You have to have a safety net. I, when I left home to go to Catholic U and was calling my mother up you know, every day, how do you do laundry? And she's like, I told you 15 times how you do laundry. <laughs> and, and you know, how do you do a checkbook, dad? And you know, mom, how, how do you lock the door? Kids need a safety net, right? It took me longer than it should to age out successfully. But kids need that. And young people who are 16, 17, and 18 and, and don't have that at all, many of those young people are, are gonna fall and we have to have a place for those kids to fall safely. We try at Covenant House to connect kids with family, tribe, community, mentors. You know, that's one of the very important roles of people who volunteer to be foster parents and adoptive parents Amen. of even slightly older children. Right, right. Uh, because they, they, then you're saying, no, no, we're not just hiring you here to be a rent a kid, but no, you're home. Amen. This is home. Amen. In, uh, to, to be that. And that's a very, even families that already have some children can oftentimes Amen. add on to that with even more kids. And they, and they and that family will do more for a young person than we at Covenant House will ever do. Because every single morning when that young person wakes up, there they are. And when that young person comes home from school for lunch, there they are. And when that young person is crushed because, you know, someone who they like doesn't like them, they're there. And when they get that first B plus, they're there. And when they stay out too late and someone has to say no curfew means curfew, they're there. I know that there are people watching tonight who are thinking to themselves, maybe we should open our homes to a child. And boy, you are so right, Father, when you say it's the teenagers, it's the, it's the slightly older kids, you know, the nine, 10. There's not a long line of families who are raising their hands and saying, okay, we're not going to take the babies. We'll take the older kids. But you, these folks watching tonight, they can change a young person's life forever by opening their hearts and their homes to a slightly older young person and then adopting them. It can change that kid's life forever. I've seen it thousands of times. Yep, yep. And it's, um, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's not challenge. easy, it's but not easy. it's something that will have an eternal effect Amen. on the soul of that kid. Sir, where are you from? 
I'm from the Houston area. Good to have you here. Well, thank you. That's the wet part of Texas. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Uh, I've got a question. Uh, before leaving and flying into Birmingham, mm -hmm. there was a news report mm -hmm. that uh, caused me grave concern. Mm -hmm. The news report was that there were many children, undocumented children, that were being rounded up by immigration and being held in camps or immigration holding facilities in major cities in Texas, Houston, Dallas, El Paso. And they were from Mexico, South America, Central America, and there were thousands and thousands, and it was becoming a, a great problem to hold these people. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could enlighten us on what's going on, what's the root cause of, of these sorts, sort of things, and is Covenant House involved in, in any, any of this? And we as laypersons, you know, is there anything that we can do to, to help and solve this solution? Okay. And, and just so that folks understand what, what's going on, it's the numbers in an average year are about 6,500 children come across the border uh, undocumented. Right now, this year, it's gone all up to 45,000. They're expecting close to 100,000 by the end of the year. I mean, this is an enormous, it's not just a little blip, it's an enormous jump. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the situation. So what, what do you know about this? So Covenant House works as Casa Alianza in Latin America, in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. I just came back from Honduras, and in the first three months of this year, 270 street children were executed. Executed. And the Who military, executed them? In my view, it's a mix of, um, of local police, of... Um, local business leaders, of other gang leaders. There is a profound crumbling um, of the respect for human life, especially human life of uh, children in these countries. And of course, the bloody drug war in Mexico, uh, the, you know, the bloody drug war in Guatemala um, has, has made so many children in these countries uh, victims. Yeah, and again, in, in Mexico, it's been about 70,000 people killed over the last five or six years. And the developments in the last two years have pushed a lot of the violence, um, you know, as the body count in Mexico is stabilized, a lot of the violence has moved south into Guatemala and Honduras, and those countries have become, particularly Honduras, much more violent in the last yes. six to yes. 12 months. Um, and so lots of families, I'm sorry to say, are turning their children over um, to coyotes, traffickers, and saying, get these kids out of here and take them north. And some of the kids are going on their own and they're showing up in the United States unaccompanied. Um, and many of these kids are worried for their lives. Many of these kids either have no families or have been sent by their families into this country. And this unfortunately is not gonna get resolved until we develop a very serious um, policy in Latin America with respect to human rights um, and peace. And um, you know, my judgment right now, at least with respect to Honduras, is that we are losing this um, region quickly. And if we don't pay and we're spending a lot of time and money, and I'm not saying wrongly, um, in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in Syria. If we don't pay attention immediately to what is happening in Latin America, and particularly in Honduras, we're not only gonna have a human rights crisis in that country, but we're going to have one in our country because these children are going to continue to flood north in droves. I mean, we see it now. Right. Let's take one more call. Hello, Patricia. Yes, Father Mitch. Yes, ma'am. Fine. Where are you from? Connecticut. And your question? Yes. First of all, Father, I'd like to thank you. I've, I've, I did my undergraduate work at a Catholic liberal arts school, and I never miss your shows. Thank you so much. I, I'm still learning. You make me feel young. <laughs> thank you. Yes, sir. And I'd like to um, uh, let you and Kevin know uh, where I'm coming from is as a 35 years ago, I was at law school, but my sister, my, her husband, and I were also in the late 70s counselors at Covenant House, and it made my heart filled with joy when I heard Kevin speaking at the beginning of the program because the mission statement has remained clearly and calmly and firmly and with love, the same as it was then, but yet clearly adapting to the changing conditions over the past 35 years. What I'd like to know is two things. Number one, do you still accept as counselors, once they've passed through the proper training, the one year commitment, life commitment that there used to be for counselors, 
Um, and number two, with regard to um, going back to the unwed mother the figures, uh, when I was there, we have 11, 12, 13-year-old girls coming in either pregnant or already having had babies at that young age. Yeah, uh, we have about 30 seconds. Okay, so the, fir so, so the first question yeah. is about a program we call the Faith Community, which is a year-long program of service where young people out of college, also empty nesters, can come to Covenant House, live in our volunteer house, and dedicate themselves to kids. My wife, then girlfriend, did it. It's how I first heard of Covenant House, and now my first son to graduate college is doing it this year. He's living at our volunteer house in Atlantic City, and he's working with kids at Covenant House, New Jersey. Oh, great. So this is still possible? It's still possible. We're <coughs> recruiting right now. The Covenant House Faith Community. Come, come, come. <laughs> and you will be doing great stuff. Again, remember the website is covenanthouse.org. And uh, they'll love to have you. Kevin, thank you oh, so God bless much you. for being and with us. And towards your anniversary. God, yes, 38 years. Is. 38 years. Mm -hmm. A good start. <laughs> <laughs> and may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we can bring you some of this great news about what's going on with Covenant House, what we can do as Catholics, and how we can serve. But we can do it because this network is brought to you by you. So we ask you to please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And God willing, we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless.